uh, I'm going to get started here. Um, tonight's show, uh, just been talking to Clay Mara in the chat, and uh, she's moving to Holland, and that's really cool. Um, she says she's going to leave all her clay where she is in Aruba, and uh, that stinks because <laughs> if I had to like pack up and leave, I mean, leaving all my clay, I have so much clay that... Uh, Wow, I'd, I'd be depressed to leave all my clay behind if I moved. But um, so just hopefully, Clay Morrow, you can tell us, you know, what you find in Holland, what's there, um, what kind of modeling clay is available. Kind of interested to hear, like, if there's Van Aken or, you know, clay, you know, clay tune clay, or if it's uh, maybe New Plast. I'm thinking it's probably something like New Plast because that's closer to the UK, but. Um, hopefully it's it's some good stuff. All right. Well, uh, anyway, uh, I see there's about five people here, so um, welcome to the show. Tonight's show, we're going to talk about uh, several different things. The first thing I wanted to post is uh, or talk about is um, something I found on the Fred Stir fan remembrance page. And um, if you guys grew up in the you know the 80s and 90s, you probably saw um, Fred Stir's work. Um, he made a lot of uh, music videos for the band Tool, um, or with the band Tool, and uh, they were they're very really dark and kind of like maybe the Brothers Quay inspired or uh, slash Jan Svenkmeyer slash you know just uh, general dark under you know undertone kind of uh, projects, and he also. I'm trying to think what else did he he made like um was it for Sepultura like that one metal band um uh, he made a music video as well with like all these voodoo characters but uh this here you know um some of his friends because he passed away uh he passed away I guess somewhere in the, the late 90s um I think it would have been like 98 or something like that uh, in the car accident, and um, so Fred Fred Stir, you know, was kind of like a guy that, if you work in the industry, you heard his name, you saw his work, and maybe you worked with him or talked to him on the phone. You know, he's one of these guys that was just really out there, and uh, you know, making a name for himself. And then his, you know, his life was cut short. And for this uh, this clip that was posted, some of his friends found just a really quick uh, behind the scenes video. And uh, hey, everybody! Hey, Don. Don Carlson's here. How's it going? And uh, so anyway, um, Fred Stir passed away, like I say, and and some of his friends dug up this, I guess, VHS tape, which was a behind the scenes video of uh, I think this would have been the the prison sex video. And he's got some of his puppets that he created and as you can see when he built everything it was very uh you know this was like what it what inspired me it's only a 13 second long clip but this is partially what inspired me to make my first film um along with webster Colcord. webster Colcord and and uh fred stir were my first inspirations into stop motion and um, so you guys probably have seen my more recent work and it's not as dark anymore as, as it used to be, at least with zombie pirate tales, you know, it wasn't dark, but, uh, you know, I was, I just thought that the, the depth of the characters, um, and his video were really amazing. And, and a lot of the things that I, I, I learned from his, uh, like this particular puppet here, um, if you studied it, uh, it's similar to the way they designed like Darth Vader's mask. And if you guys know Darth Vader in the, the early films, his mask wasn't symmetrical, which means that both sides of his face were slightly different. So what they would do is they would, because Darth Vader is a, you know, his, his mask is, uh, isn't um, expressive, right? So if they wanted to have a certain look to... Darth Vader, they would do several different things. They would have him look uh, right to left or left to right. And now this doesn't. This is not the same as in the prequels. The prequels they they made him symmetrical, and I don't know why because it's it's limiting. But um, 
depending on the lighting, they would light Darth Vader from more or less from underneath and get some more of uh, less less shadows from above from his helmet, so he would have less of a frown. Um, you know, and the the director of photography, uh, at least in the first three films from the seventies, eighty, and the eighties. Um, you know, they, they took advantage of the lack of symmetry on the face. And if you see this character here, what's neat about it is, you know, one eye is kind of sloped. It looks kind of sad. And then the other one is kind of straight. Um, so Fred Sturr, I think, I don't know if it was by um, design or not, but this was one of the things that um, I had heard, you know, he had potentially put into his design is, is to not put symmetry or make both sides the same. Because this character's face is similar like Darth Vader. It's a hard, um, it might even be like Super Sculpey, but he made a mold of this as well that he cast in wax and painted to be similar to the, this puppet. And then he would sit in this chair and fall back and, uh, and he used either a, a hair dryer or a heat gun and did some time lapse of his face melting, you know. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to show the video, but I, I just thought, you know, this is like a little rare piece of history here. You can see, you know, how he built the set and it's very, and it's almost like this was a display or something like he took, took all of his stuff and made a display out of it from, from his video to sort of preserve it maybe. Um, but I know that, uh, Fred and the band tool, they had like this little falling, like, like a drama of some sort between them and, um, and the uh, the lead singer of Tool, the band, ended up making future videos or, you know, using somebody else as a, um, you know, animator for their their projects and, and videos and all. But, but really, you know, Fred Sturr was the main influence and, you know, he did this recognizable character that I think most people, if you grew up, like I say, in the 80s or 90s, and you were inspired by stop motion, you know, you'd watch MTV late at night and you'd see this video and, and it's sort of stuck in your imagination. And um, and a lot of people will, will cite Fred Sturr as their inspiration, modern inspiration for why they get into stop motion. So, and it's really sad that he's gone because I, I mean, he would have probably made uh, who knows what, you know, uh, after, uh, after, uh, you know, the point that he passed away. He, I mean, he was just very into what he did. And he just put everything into into his work. Um, and he was great at it, too. He was a good good uh, animator as well. I mean, you might think it's kind of jerky, but this, his style was unique and expressive. And uh, anyway, so uh, I just wanted to show you guys that. And uh, just like a little rare behind-the-scenes thing that... Um, you know, just recently surfaced from his archives of sorts. Oh yeah, so Don, Don is saying, uh, Don Carlson says that Fred Sturr did the opening sequence for the Chevy Chase show. That's right. And uh, was it Sepultura, Don? I think it was Sepultura that he did a, that video for. Um, it's like the voodoo, voodoo characters and stuff. And it's all just like, you know, there's I think there's no words so much in that video it's just kind of like grunting and like you know wookie 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 kind of um primal kind of grunts and everything <laughs> um oh and, and okay so misha klein i didn't know he was inspired by uh by fred Sturr, but that makes sense because the 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 fred the fred film that he made looks pretty similar too so yeah i mean a lot of people really liked his work and but anyway, that's how life is, right? It's temporary, so. But anyways, um, now, moving on. Uh, last weekend, um, my wife and I went to a, one of her friend's kids' birthday parties and uh, down in Nixa, where, you know, which is about uh, 25 minutes or so away from where we live. And uh, he, his son is pretty close in age to my son, and he showed... Uh, his father showed me uh, something that they made in the garage, and it was this um, 
almost like I thought it was an like a adult version of an erector set or something. And um, he showed it to me, and it was really sturdy. It was made out of these extruded pieces of aluminum, and I had, I've never seen anything like this before until I went to inside his garage and he showed me what he was working on. And um, what what is this? So you're you're probably saying, why are you showing us this strange aluminum stuff? Well, the reason why is because this is meant to design things, um, structural things, in order to uh, it's it's modular. And for example, if you have something you want to build on your set, let's say you want to elevate the whole set uh, by, you know, just the tabletop. You want to elevate it uh, on something that you can get your hands under there and get underneath and, um, you know, go underneath the set and put tie downs or uh, magnetic tie downs or whatever you have. Well, you can lift up the set and you can use these things, which are um, essentially, how can I explain these? Well, let me let me show you guys. This is what he used. Um, and I think this is in millimeters. So it's 20 millimeters by 20 millimeters. And the length is somewhere around three feet, I think. Let me see here. Oh, okay. Now the length is uh, almost 10 foot long and this cost $26 for a 10 foot long piece, right? So what do you do with these things? Let's show you guys. All right. So you've got this aluminum part and it's got these grooves. And what you do is you uh, you buy some, uh, and it's on the side as well, and it's from framingtech.com. Um, you take these little hex head cap screws and you take a little flat piece of metal which slides into this groove and it has holes that are tapped. And from above, these small grooves up here, what those do is, um, is it accepts uh, another piece that you can basically put these together with screws temporarily and take them apart from in any arrangement. And they're super solid, they're very strong, they're structurally sound, um, they can bear a lot of weight, and you can put them in any sort of configuration, and you can buy pieces that stick on here and slide in at 45 degree angles. Um, you can buy hinges, so you can have things swivel on these. And you basically just cut it, you take a hacksaw, or some other, uh, you know, cutting instrument, either, um, you know, you can use like a power hacksaw as well, or a jigsaw with a um, hacksaw blade, if you wanted to, to do a quicker job. And you can sand these things perfectly flat on like a belt sander, make them at any length that you need. And then uh, when you do that, you can, you know, construct all kinds of whatever you need. So one thing I was thinking of, uh, doing for myself was buying some of these, maybe two or three, and putting them together and then uh, hanging it off of the ceiling above my set so I can attach my lights to this. It would allow you to uh, attach a light and slide it along these tracks, uh, suspend them above your set wherever you want. You can, you know, you don't have to worry about, uh, for example, like what I would do in the past was I have some some beams in the garage and I would clamp things to those beams, right? Uh, but you're limited to where you can put a light depending on where the beam is. Well, this thing here allows you to slide your lights around anywhere you want. Um, and then you have these uh, fasteners. And these are some of the things that you essentially, you slide inside there. These are T-nuts, right? So what they do is they slide into those grooves and like I say, from above, what you do is uh, you put in a, a hex head cap screw, and that hex head cap screw goes through the part that uh, you know another another piece of metal. Or I'm trying to think here. Uh, these are fasteners. They have frame frames the floor, but you have uh, floor brackets which you can use to attach the whole thing to the ceiling and suspend it. 
Uh, you also have, um, I know they have right, an right angle pieces as well. Uh, casters, doors, specialty, solutions. Um, the only thing I, I, unfortunately, I can't show you. Well, let's see here. Okay, so here's, for example, um, something that was put together. You can see uh, with these pieces and so you can you know make a cart if you wanted to um, you can actually build a uh, you know a cart for your your frame grabbing system put some wheels on there uh, you can put your tools on there and like I say you can suspend things from the ceiling like your lights um, you can also build small things as well like uh, um, like rigs for your characters to, um, you know, fly if you wanted to. Something that's suspended and then have things slide around uh, within the grooves. But like I say, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of things I can show you in terms of finished, you know, products made by these. But they had these roller wheels. And these specifically are used... Uh, to roll around within those grooves. So if you wanted to make a camera rig where your whole entire camera slides uh, slides around, you know, you can do that with this. It's basically like, a, you know, an engineer's erector set, basically. So, uh, hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm just catching up on the chat. Uh, so Jason is saying, a rack and pinion would be nice to set up a, a manual motion controller. Yeah. Yeah, you could do that with this, which is really awesome. And uh, I know they have all kinds of strange specialty things. Uh, cable binding clips. So if you you know have wires, uh, maybe for a motion control rig or something, you need wires to stick on there. Uh, there's conveyor parts, conveyor rollers, there's uh, a counterbalance spring, you know, all these things that if you really can think up something, I don't know why you would need a cup holder exactly, but <laughs> um, sensor mounting blocks, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what you do with this. Used to mount proximity switches to the side of aluminum profiles. Sensor may be located at a precise angle using the small serrated uh, positioning bushings for a switch diameter of 6.5 millimeters. So, uh, you know, if you're an electrical engineer, that's probably a good thing. There's also machining jigs as well. There's a drill jig. So all kinds of just cool stuff. And uh, you can stick on doors. You have uh, hinges. You have handles, latches, uh, catches, magnetic catches, uh, bifold door kit. All right. But uh, anyway, this is it. And there's all kinds of different shapes and, and sizes. And you can buy them uh, to be super, super strong. Let me see what's the largest size. I think uh, they've got an inch. They have mostly millimeter, but they've got an inch one here too. Uh, they've got specialty parts. 40 millimeter, 35, 60 millimeter, 90 millimeter with a 10 millimeter slot. So 90 millimeters is pretty nice. But uh, these are these look like they're fairly expensive. Uh, $450. Four. Well, that's almost 20 feet long. So depending on what you're doing, maybe that's good. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, just for like, let's say, what is a 40 millimeter? So 40 millimeter by 40 millimeter by 20 feet is $100. But you can actually do quite a lot with that. So, 
Uh, anyways, um, framingtech.com is the is the company, and uh, you can see here uh, they were founded in 2002, and uh, and and the the basis behind their products is essentially to build things without having to weld. Um, so if you're not a good welder and you want to build something strong and you want to want to make it modular, uh, which is especially good for stop motion, you know, for like I say, for lighting rigs, flying rigs, or any kind of rig, um, it's a great thing to to learn about and and see if you can um, see if you can utilize it. Let's kind of see what this support structure looks like here. Okay. Oh, okay. So they've got uh, they've actually got plans for different things you can do. Uh, sheet metal storage rack. If you wanted to do that, a forensic fume chamber, folding spool table, fixture frame, uh, equipment enclosure. So you can really build anything that your brain can think up, you know, anything your imagination can uh, come up with, or if you have a problem to solve, you can pretty much do it. It's pretty awesome. Clay Mara, if you can send me a Facebook message uh, with a link to your film, okay? I can show it to everybody. And Jason Morrow says, too bad the exchange rate to Canada is terrible right now. Yeah, it's taxes and customs and all that stuff is a pain in the butt with shipping things overseas. <laughs> okay, so now, anyway, that I just wanted to show you guys that. Uh, I don't know what you think about it, but uh, it could definitely save you some headache in trying to build things. Um, Tim Smith says, how do I see what folks are writing? I am on a Mac on YouTube and cannot see the text. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know why that would be. Maybe, um, refresh, refresh your page. Try that. I really don't know why. I'm not sure. Is YouTube not Macintosh friendly? Does anybody know? Or perhaps a different browser. Maybe there's some reason, or maybe you have some sort of, uh, you know, plugins on your browser that's preventing it. I'm not sure. May or maybe it's JavaScript based, and then you're blocking JavaScript. All right. Well, anyways. Um, so moving on, guys. Uh, this is about 20 minutes long. What time is it? 8:22. Should we watch the whole thing? Um, this is actually really cool, and it's a lot of fun to watch. Um, but before I get to that, let me first talk about this here. Uh, somebody posted this up on Facebook, and it looked like a pretty neat project. Now, Jason Morrow was saying that, that YouTube is working for him. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, Tim. I wish I could help. But, you know, that's more a YouTube thing. I'm not sure if I can do anything about that. You're definitely not blocked or anything because I, I see what you're typing. But, uh, anyways, um, so I'm going to read this really quick uh, or just kind of summarize what this is. Uh, David Cronenberg, it says, is getting into the animation game, perhaps running low on pieces of metal that he can shape into horrifying medical instruments. The director is instead. Instead, <clears throat> turning his attention to an award-winning short film, Dread Central reports, the Canadian uh, author is planning to uh, adapt Foxed, a dark little animated short that has just been made available to watch for free online. Closer in tone to Coraline than a Pixar flick and frankly a lot darker than even that would suggest, the short manages to be genuinely creepy and tell a complete story in just a few minutes while leaving plenty of questions for a much longer narrative. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, we're going to watch this here. And uh, it's about four and a half minutes. And it's, it says uh, it's from James Stewart. 
and I have not seen this before today and uh, it seems like it's pretty well made so let's check it out here Let's go. If you're late one more time, Miss Patterson's gonna give me detention. Mom? I'm right here, Mom. Haven't you noticed me I'm missing? I'm ready to go, Mom. My voice? No. No. You're ready for school on no. time? Mom! I don't know who you are, but what have you done with my daughter? What do you... Yes! You just haven't seemed yourself. You seem almost... Mom! Turn! I don't know. I, I, I just... I like the new you. Thanks, Mom. It's a fox! I'll see you after school. It's not me! Just look at it! Yes, have a good day, Mother. You too, Emily. I love you. No, 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 no. I love you more. No. Interesting little short, <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully Tim Smith will, can see what, what we're talking about here. That would be good. I don't really know what is going on with his Mac, but it could be maybe you know I tried to load some stuff on YouTube before. My Wix.com webpage is, is down, so maybe it's maybe it's got something to do with the internet being kind of slow or something. All right. So anyway, that uh, you can find that on Vimeo, and it's called Foxed, and it's from James Stewart. And uh, here's their Facebook page, and uh, I'm gonna like it. 
Yeah, it's available on iTunes, so I guess you can see the whole film there. And uh, the website is foxed, F O X E D movie.com. And uh, maybe these guys are part of like a, a larger production company or something. I'm not really sure. Uh, but here's their website. Yeah, you know, it seems like they used face paddles and they also maybe like replaced the face for the, the M shape. Like if you notice um, the, the, the phonem for M, you know, the M, mm, every time she used that, it's like her face, face flickered on there. And uh, the eyebrows, what do you guys think of the eyebrows? The eyebrows here look like they're almost digitally stuck on there. Uh, and if they're not... Yeah, so they're, they're missing the eyebrows here. Uh, there's no shadow on the eyebrows. So I think they kind of use like a, a quasi, um, you know, some half CG or part CG slash part puppet based film. Uh, maybe there was a reason why. Maybe they were trying to figure out how to, you know, because sticking stuff to silicone is not easy. So maybe they were trying to figure out how to do that and couldn't figure out how to stick the eyebrows on so they they went digital silicone's a pretty interesting thing to use uh for puppets but there's a lot of problems involved in trying to get past the fact that you know nothing sticks to it uh painting it can be if you're new to it it can be confusing And Nick says, it uh, looked like silicone most of the time, but some changes looked like replacement faces, he says. So he thinks it might be replacements as well. Uh, so I have a behind the scenes here. Let's just see what we find. So here's an interview. And I guess maybe this is the uh, creator of it. And I would not have suggested or... Uh, well, it's the story of Emily, and she has been kidnapped by foxes, and she must dig so down deep and fight her way back to uh, uncover the uh, secret of the foxes. So it's a story about human darkness and fighting for what you believe in and, and uh, digging down deep and, and, and facing your demons. So this is the lead fox, which we were calling Black Nose, and also uh, I call him Clarence, just for fun. He's our lead fox, and this is Emily, our lead character. It's played by Athena Carcanis in the film. Athena Carcanis has done a lot of animated work. She was also in the Saw films, and she plays Emily as a young girl. So she, she puts on this uh, young girl voice, but not only is she doing it as a young girl, she does the good Emily and the bad Emily. If you haven't seen the film, you won't know what that means, but she plays two different Emily characters. The good Emily is in her pajamas, and she's been working in the mine, so she's a little dirty. She's been dirtied up a little bit, but, uh, but yeah, she's, she's very resilient and she's, uh, she's gone through a lot. She's done a lot of work frame by frame. The bad Emily is the perfect child. So in the eyes, we only see her um, through the mother's point of view. And so she's the perfect child. And uh, the bad Emily, which is like every kid, uh, every kid experiences being the bad kid at some point. They feel that they, uh, they butt heads with their parents because their parents want them to do one thing and be someone and they want to be individuals. And as we grow up, we always fight to be individuals and be recognized. And so part of the story, one of the themes in the story is about children and the communication with the parents and, and you know, being who your parents want to be in your parents' eyes. So we do see the child from the point of view of the parents, the perfect child. And then we also see the reality, Emily, as she tries to reclaim her life. Yeah, we've had an incredible success with the film. It's, it's unbelievable. The, the little film just has a life of its own. We've played about 80 film festivals so far, and we've won seven Best Animation Awards. I'm really excited about After Dark, because After Dark has a, has a rabid, excuse the pun, but rabid fan base. And any festival that has six or eight hundred people in the seats and they're fanatic is that's the audience we want to play in front of. So we've had a great reception. We're almost done our festival run, and After Dark is the, the perfect pre-Halloween treat. They're going to get to see Fox, and we're launching on iTunes. So there's 
there's a there's a great uh, great symmetry with the festival and with the iTunes launch and with Halloween and our little scary funny movie. We shot uh, Foxed in 3D, so we shot it with a it's stop motion, shot frame by frame with a Canon 5D, but we shot a left and right eye, so it is in stereoscopic 3D. We've played at festivals in 3D, we've played in 2D, um, but it was a really great experiment for us to see could we shoot stop motion with a, a, a prosumer camera, I guess maybe a Canon 5D is a, is a professional camera, but could we shoot it with a still camera in 3D and show it on the big screen and, and compete with, with Hollywood? And, and we've launched on iTunes at number one and number two, three, and four are Disney and Pixar. So um, we're thrilled to be Canadians and to be on top of the charts in iTunes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a thrilling time. I've always loved 3D, and uh, I've been in this sort of digital revolution of 3D for the, the past 10 years. And I've always loved 3D as an immersive way to tell stories. So I was very excited when digital cinema happened and all the digital screens went 3D, or a lot of them did. And uh, so to make a 3D film and know that you can play it at a Cineplex in Canada, you can play it worldwide in a multiplex, is very exciting for us. Yeah, so, so the future of Fox is we have a feature film script and we are developing the film as a feature. So it's a story, it's a bigger story of Emily and all the kids in the village get kidnapped by foxes and they have to work through their own personal demons to work together and come back and reclaim the village. Oh, I love these guys. We've spent many, many hours tweaking them and playing with them. And, and uh, I like uh, Clarence here with his, his little one tooth, his evil one tooth. And, uh, and Emily, is a, she's a survivor in more ways than one. She survives in the story and uh, lives to fight another day, but also the puppet is surviving. It's spent a lot of time moving very meticulously and she's holding together. She's made out of uh, uh, latex and she has a steel armature inside her that allows her to move but stay fairly rigid in between motions. And uh, it's a, it's a stop motion is a beautiful art form. Uh, the way the puppets move and the way they express themselves is uh, very unique, unlike CG animation. Perfect. Thank you, James. Yes, more Canadians, Jason. <laughs> Maybe it's your neighbor and you don't even, don't even know it, right? <laughs> But uh, so that's James Stewart, and that was um, a pretty nice little interview, and explains his film project. And uh, sounds like they're, you know, I never heard of it till today. Uh, and it sounds like he's already competing with some of the bigger, you know, companies out there. And number, he says he's like number, number four out of uh, like the top. You know, he's like, I think he said uh, Disney and Pixar are on the top, and then he's like number three or four. So that's pretty awesome. And it's a stop motion film, right? So that's cool. So good storytelling is uh, is the key there. And if you notice um, the faces that they were using here, of uh... it's like they've got a few different faces, and they've got maybe some kind of face paddles in each replacement face. So. They can swap uh, those out. Latex and here you can see the mechanisms inside there. It's got ball and socket uh, paddles and a silicone skin. And it looks like the silicone is attached to like some sort of maybe either 3D printed or cast understructure here to keep so it keeps its shape. And uh Looks like it's made from brass and maybe steel. She has a steel armature inside her that allows and her to move but stay fairly rigid so pretty... in between motions. So I guess, uh, Nick, we were we were right there. And uh, it's a it's a stop motion is a beautiful art form. Uh, yeah, I the way the puppets move latex, and the way they express themselves. Is, Especially uh, the hands, they're all shiny. Very unique, unlike CG animation. And it's translucent, so I'm pretty sure he meant to say silicone. But it looks like there might be some some foam underneath the uh, surrounding the armature. If we look again here, uh, latex, and she has a steel armature inside her that allows her to move but stay fairly rigid in between. There might be some foam underneath underneath her clothes there, 
as opposed to silicone because it looks like they've pulled it away to get to the mechanisms. So there's all kinds of interviews on here on uh, foxedmovie.com, F-O-X-E-D movie.com. So I'm going to watch all these later. Um, we're not going to watch all these tonight, although that looks like it's really cool. So I'm going to save that for later. Maybe I'll even post that on our uh, Facebook fan page for you guys. Um, so anyway, Clay Mara wants us to watch some of her films now. And so let me bring up her message to me. Let me bring these up. And uh, here we go. Okay, so which one should I show first? <laughs> We've got the... Uh, We've got Castel, Water Planet, and Koragahimi, Tsukimi, and Clara. So how about we watch um, this one first here? Okay, Tim, sorry it's not working for you. That stinks. Uh, Tim's got some technical issues. All right. Well, anyway. Uh, let's watch this real quick. This is from Clay Mara, and it's called uh, Kura Gehimi Tsukimi and Clara. So let's see what this is about. So it's like almost like an underwater creature, almost like a uh, either an octopus or a uh, <laughs> what do you call it? Um, they sting you in the water. Jellyfish. <laughs> So however you suspended that, you did a good job getting rid of the uh, either the wire or or the rig. It's a good job. And Nick says, big white anime style reflections in the eyes. Yeah, jellyfish. <laughs> I couldn't think of it. And luckily, I have never been stung by a jelly jellyfish before. <laughs> I heard that's not a very fun thing to have happen. So this one here is from Claymore. It's called Castile uh, Water Planet. And it's about two and a half minutes long. So that's a pretty good, good amount of animation to do for two and a half minutes. Let's watch it.
eyes and see the world of clay animation. We have lots of stories to tell you. Like, comment and subscribe for more clay animation videos. Cool. Now, I think you probably you meant to uh, put little boxes around here. You know, I've never learned how to do that in in uh, YouTube videos. There's like a way to link to your different uh, like Facebook and everything on there. That's really neat. You know, I like the I like the way you you use all these bright colors, especially like the coral. I mean, this is really awesome. And how you uh, demonstrated the different fish that live in there. It's really neat. Great job. Yeah, that's really beautiful actually. I like the it's like you're you you've got this painterly style. I know I always mention it, but I like the way that you use like the different colors and kind of blend them together and and get these different effects. Um and some good sculpting on your on your fish too. <laughs> Very cool. And there's just something neat about clay, isn't there? All right. Well, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing, Clay Mora. It's great. I hope to see some more, actually. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, I guess how much time? We have only 10 more minutes left to the show. I can't believe it. Wow. Time really goes by really quick, let me tell you. When you're having fun watching clay animation videos and stuff and learning new things. Um, okay, well, we're going to watch, uh, now last week, if you guys recall, we watched uh, some Shaun the Sheep videos. And there was some discussion about, um, do the sheep, how are their feet connecting to the ground? Is it, they're sticking, using tie down to the set floor? Are they using model movers where they're above the floor? Um, how are they doing that? And so hopefully in this video... Uh, this here is Shaun the Sheep Series 1 3DS Behind the Scenes. Now, I haven't watched the whole thing yet, so I'm hoping we'll get some clues as to whether Shaun the Sheep and uh, all his fellow characters are, you know, how are they sticking, sticking them to the ground? Hopefully this will reveal the secrets. It's about seven and a half minutes long. And uh, again, this is Shaun the Sheep Series 1 Behind the Scenes. Let's watch. Bald. Uh. And he just gets his little hairdo. Yeah, it's not that sucking. Oops, his hair's coming off. Whoops, <laughs> 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 Daisy. Poor Sean. Obviously, that wouldn't have happened if I'd have managed to spend the time to actually find oh, somewhere to okay. lock him up. Let's just, just see him complete. There you, go. you hold off on the sheet. If you're putting out some sheet, there he is. There he is. Can you there just, he is. Him, just put it, pick him up and put him down so we've got it cut. Yep. yep. Okay. His head stay down. It's ridiculous. There he goes. I mean, most of the armatures of the sheep are, are simply wire, but any human characters um, and bits are as well have got these sort of ball and socket joints. And why do you, why do you have uh, the, well, the armature is basically the thing, um, it, it's the skeleton of the puppet and it's what the, the animator is actually moving during the, um, during the animation process. So, so we, t we tension these joints uh, and that allows the, the puppet to bend and hold its pose. And you imagine if it's, it's just plasticine, uh, it would be uh, too heavy to support itself. So we, have, so we have these sort of rigid skeletons inside that um, are, you're able to pose. Just like people? Yeah. yeah. Just like people. It's really authentic. Yeah, with these shots, we um, we just did replacement heads. So when the egg fell on the head, we took the head off and put this head on for the last shot. So, oh, so this is the same sheep at different stages? Same of the sheep. Egg but with a different head. So uh -huh. as the egg comes down, we just replace the head. Didn't have to get these to match up. 
Do they actually join up? No, they. <laughs> it'll jump from a. It doesn't from need the to. From a whole one to. It's, to crack. Sorry, yeah. to Titanic. Okay, the um, the milk comes in through these pipes, and the cartons uh, come down this chute, and uh, they come out out of this hole, and then they get get um, pulled along this roller conveyor belt, um, and there's lots of pressure gauges and and dials to um, turn it all on and off. And we've got um, like the power supply, which will come in here. And some flashing lights as well. Uh, the lights. From the control panel, you'll have um, the on and off button, which will light up. So. Excellent. Yeah, one of the things actually that um, Land Rover were asking for was a paint swab, so they could match the colour, but. The base colour of this is an incredibly bright blue, but it's had a number of dirty washes put over the top of it, so it's just about impossible to match. I, don't, I, I was trying to think, if I was asked to produce a high finish um, cellulose paint on, on a, an actual size Land Rover, it'd be almost impossible to recreate this, because this is all done in sort of Roscoe washes and things that are built up and it's been retouched and bits more put on it. So it would be quite difficult to... Are they gonna do a sort of 30 version? Yeah, they, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, they, they want all the detail that's in this, yeah. they want it as, as similar as possible. I don't know how they're going to do the dents. I mean, the dents are quite subtle on it, but again, they, they will be, I mean, things like the bonnet and stuff. I mean, these are carved into, I mean, this is solid MDF, whereas the bonnet is, is vac foam plastic, the same as this, so I just needed to heat a, a wee spoon and push it into it to get a dent. And same the, but it is, like I say, incredibly primitive. But what you don't see in here is there's magnets hidden in the ends of, of the doors, so that when they shut, Oh, so they, they register, and that, so if the animator needs to open the door to move the puppet, when they close it, it should always go back to exactly the same place. There's a little bit of play in it, but um, that's because, I mean, it's, this is 12 months on. This is one of the first things we made on the, yeah. the start of the series, and it has been battered. Yeah, the headlights, that was, again, it was, I turned up some formers and then with clear vac um, foam plastic, just melted it over the top. Um, and it's just aluminium wire on the outside. It was all done really quite scratch and garage and, you know, roughly built, but it is solid. <laughs> Little bow. <laughs> um, yeah, let's just see. Da, da, da. Okay, so if and they can go up and down and move that again. All it is, all a trick. And all that is, there's built into Sean and all the other puppets, dotted at various useful points around the body, there's rigging points. So in this case, there's one here on Sean. He also has one under his arms, each side, and front and back. And that connects him to a ball and socket joint here, which gets the, the rocking movements. Put him in so there's your rig. Whatever you want. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's doing a little bit too much. <laughs> I'm trying to get his mouth opening slowly, but because his chin is so close to his collar, it's quite proving to be quite difficult. I might have to sculpt away at the bottom. This is kind of how much we're, we're still we're about halfway through this episode, so we've still got some storyboard drawings. Um, but some of the shots are cut in and we've done them already. So this is Sean, he kind of bounces along a telegraph wire, <laughs> gets stuck in a bucket. <laughs> and um, just keeps on sheep sleepwalking away and they're, they're just kind of left stranded there. And uh, we're going to have some, have some rain come down. Yeah, that's going to be um, post effects. So they're stuck up there. <coughs> and they're and then, just left. <laughs> yeah, they're left there. So we go to the morning and Sean's left in an empty barn. And um, <laughs> with a bucket on his head. Doesn't know what's happened. And um, we've got this lovely last shot of the farmer waking up and then he kind of hears something and they're all still up there, still <laughs> stranded. <laughs> Some so, asleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bags under their eyes. That was lovely. So, 
Okay, pretty awesome. Uh, so they did use a uh, model mover here and... Arms at each side and front and back. And that connects him to a ball and socket joint here which gets the, the rocking movements. So they show... It's like a, uh, a gear system. So uh, this is probably all custom machined here. But uh, yeah, I mean, Nick, Nick is saying he should, he'd like to make one for all the shots where a character walks, but you don't see the legs. Oop. My cat's clawing me. He wants to leave the room. <laughs> you got to stay in here, you. Um, but I wonder how you'd make one of these. Because I'm, I'm kind of curious how they tension these gears so that the, the whole thing doesn't just go down by itself under the weight of the puppet. I mean, so there's your rig. Whatever you want. Yeah. So they, they probably have uh, All right. some way of tensioning that on there. Hmm. It's pretty uh, pretty awesome. And also I kind of wonder why they... to a ball and socket joint here which gets the, the rock. You know, it seems like this plate could be a bit narrower. Like if they have two characters side by side, you know, side by side here, um, the next puppet would have to be fairly far. You know, we're talking about maybe four inches away. So I wonder if they have these of, of uh, different widths or not. And also the handle is kind of wide too, so... Uh, it would be sturdy and heavy to to hold the puppet up, but I'm I'm curious what if they have some rigs for other purposes there. And uh, so Nick says I would use a cam system, turn the knob in one direction, and it automatically eases out before changing direction. Use one for a rocking boat. That's a pretty cool thing. Wow. I'm interested to know the engineering behind that, how that would be constructed with, you know, maybe some kind of gears and things. And I guess if you go to like smallparts.com here in America, I think Small Parts or McMaster Car, they probably have all that you would need for that. And Jason says in regards to uh, Shaun the Sheep, the, the feature, he said, I watched it this weekend. There were a lot of feet on the ground. <laughs> That's interesting to know. Yeah, it seems like, you know, if they have a bigger budget, they would do that because they have uh, probably more people and want to make it as nice and professional as possible. All right. Well, Can anyway, guys, uh, I was going to watch um, Adam Can Savage talk about uh, model making for movies. And we don't have time for that because it's about 20, 20 minutes uh, long. Uh, but if you guys are interested, maybe, you know, for this week, if you want to learn something about how they make models and, uh, in particular plastic models like these, which are used like, look like we just watched for Sean the Sheep where they made the car. Um, this has got, you know, some good information, information in it on how they do that. Uh, and it's called Inside Adam Savage's Cave, Model Making for Movies. And uh, this is, you know, used in a lot of films, especially, you know, in the olden, golden days of filmmaking. Uh, and, of course, like I say, in, in modern stop-motion films even. So definitely check it out. Uh, but that does conclude our show for tonight. Hopefully you guys will stop by next weekend or next weekend, next week on Wednesday, uh, 8 o'clock Central. Same time, same place. Um, and good luck with your projects. See you guys all later.